And to understand kind of our, our core philosophy around learning, uh, you know, you might have heard these, you know, Benjamin Bloom's mastery learning, which is really what we ended up implementing or, or what I ended up kind of doing with, with my cousins. And to kind of appreciate what it's about, in a traditional academic model, the one that most of us grew up in, uh, you group students together by age, and later on sometimes age and perceived ability, and you move them all together at a set pace. And what typically happens is kind of like a, like a conveyor line is that you know, they're at one stage, let's say we're in a middle school class, we're learning basic exponents, uh, you get a, uh, uh, we have some lecture homework, lecture homework, oh, something interesting's happened. We have some lecture homework, lecture homework on basic exponents, and then we have a test after two weeks. And let's say on that test, I get a 70%, you get an 80%, uh, you get a 95%. Even though that we have identified gaps on that test, what was that 30% I didn't know? Even that A student, what was the 5% that she didn't know? The whole class then moves in lockstep onto the next concept. Probably a concept that's going to build on those gaps. It might be negative exponents, or fractional exponents, or logarithms. Somehow expecting the student that didn't know 30% of the basic material to somehow master the more advanced one. And this, these gaps keep accumulating until at some point you get into an algebra class and nothing makes sense anymore, not because you're not bright or algebra, algebra is difficult, but because there's an exponent in that, in that equation and you never learn that well. And to appreciate how absurd that is on some level, imagine if we did other things in our life that way. And I'll see if this thing, uh, let, let's say home building. So you, you, you talk to the contractor and you say, we have two weeks to build a foundation, do what you can. So they do what they can, maybe it rains, supplies don't show up, after two weeks the inspector comes and says, okay, that part's not quite up to code, I'll give it an 80%. You say, great, that's a C, let's build the first floor. <laughs> Same thing, we have three weeks, do what you can. And then after the inspector shows up, it's a 70%, great, let's build the third floor. And then while you're building the third floor, the whole structure collapses. And if your reaction to that is the reaction we typically have in education, we said, well, maybe the contractor was the issue, or maybe we needed more inspection. And maybe that's part of it, but what was really flawed was the process. You're artificially constraining how long and when to tackle something, pretty much ensuring a variable outcome, A, B, C, D, F, and then you take the trouble of identifying those gaps, but then you ignore them, and then you move on, and eventually those gaps become so debilitating that the whole structure collapses. Now, if, I, if we were here 50 years ago, you say, well, that's nice, Al, but how could you actually, if you let everyone flex when and how they learn something, how would you do it? the logistics of, a, of 30 students in a classroom with, with one teacher? It would have been impossible. But what's exciting now is we do have the tools to do it. That's what's something that software is good at, that whether you're a student like Jonathan and they're learning at their own time and pace, or whether you're one of 30 students in a class, now we can give the teachers the tools and the students the tools so that they can all learn at their own time and pace. And so, you know, one of the exciting things, you know, one of the things that gets me up in the morning is to hear testimonials like Jonathan's or we get them by email all the time. But also, you know, we're pretty hard-nosed about measuring efficacy. And one of the most exciting partnerships we've had, and you're going to hear a lot more about it today, is, you know, David Coleman, and he really gets the bulk of the credit for this, reached out to Khan Academy uh, about three years ago and says, look, we have to address the inequity around test prep, or at least the perceived inequity. And he says, we've been looking at y'all, and we like how y'all approach learning, especially around mastery learning, and the quality of, of what you're doing, and you're doing it for free in your nonprofit. And so we've collaborated together to make free test prep, the best test prep for the world that happens to be free. And what's been especially exciting about it is the PSAT, which a bulk of American high school students take, in the past, it was just a random test in, in the 10th or 11th grade that gave you an indication of how you might do on the SAT, but that's all it was. But now when you take the PSAT, when the students get their score, there's a link, and if they click on that link, it syncs their account with Khan Academy. And now the PSAT acts as the world's largest personalized learning diagnostic because the software in Khan Academy will then know what your strengths and weaknesses are in math and reading and in, in writing, and it can immediately do weak point training for you. And what you see on that first bullet point, we were able to do a study with the College Board following 250,000 students from their linking from the PSAT, doing the personalized practice all the way through the SAT. And what we saw is that 20 hours of practice was associated with twice as, 
twice the expected gain that you would typically see from a student from 11th to 12th grade. So instead of a roughly 50, 60 point improvement, we were seeing 110, 120 point improvement. There are other studies. There was a big, pilot, a big study in Idaho a few years ago where we saw something similar with 10,000 students, 80% uh, more than expected gain. Another study that we're actually about to release about Brazil uh, where we saw, and this was a controlled study, where we took the classrooms that swapped out one hour a week and they did personalized practice on Khan Academy, they saw 30% more gain than was expected. And so what's exciting about this is not just the efficacy studies, but it's the notion that we can even do efficacy studies like this now. That we can talk about hundreds of thousands or millions of students doing personalized practice and that being able to measure how well it's working at a fairly granular level which gives us confidence that, hey, this is helping, but it also allows us and the College Board to continuously improve what we're working on.